Welcome once again to session five. And under this session, we are going to look at kyphosis, lordosis, and scoliosis. I know students are fond of these conditions. We see them as interesting, but they are conditions which make our patients, our victims, our clients uncomfortable. We need to know as our goals and objectives, the definition for kyphosis, lordosis, and scoliosis mentions some specific management of these conditions and then to be able to differentiate between kyphosis, lordosis, and scoliosis. And then you should be able to prepare patients with these conditions for spinal fusion. So the session seeks to introduce students to the management of patients with kyphosis, lordosis, and scoliosis. And these are spinal cord disorders that may affect both children and adults. The management will depend on the cause of the disorder, and it's therefore the responsibility of the nurse or student nurse to be knowledgeable about the causes to be able to care for these patients. So these are the key topics that will be covered in the session. Definition, incidence, the causes, classification, signs and symptoms, and the management of these conditions. Our first topic is kyphosis. Now what is kyphosis? Kyphosis can be defined as an over-exaggeration of the posterior thoracic curvature of the spine. And it's a progressive spinal cord disorder. It may affect both children and adults. And the disorder may also cause a deformity, which is often described as humpback or hunchback. Kyphotic curves are commonly found in the thoracic or thoracolumbar spine, although they can be cervical as well. And the deformity can be in the form of hyperkyphosis or sharp angular gibus. So in the picture, we have the normal curve, that is the first picture, and then kyphosis is in the middle. Later on, we are going to discuss scoliosis and lordosis. So the third person or the third client we are seeing in our picture is a typical case of kyphosis. And there's an abnormal curvature of the back. So in the picture, we have the first person having a normal curvature. And the second one is scoliosis, which will be discussed later. And then in the third picture is a typical example of kyphosis, which is being discussed, or which is under discussion now. And then lordosis will also be discussed later. So we still have more pictures of kyphosis and lordosis. The first one is scoliosis, and the second one is kyphosis. Kyphosis affects all age groups, but it's common in males than in females. You need to do more research to know why it's common in males. Then when we look at causes, primarily it's caused by postural round back. We have Shevenman's disease. It may be congenital. That is, the individual may be born with it, or it may be a neuromuscular disorder. We may also have the secondary causes, which may be due to trauma, conditions like tumors, arthritis, and infections. Now, what are some of the manifestations of kyphosis? The individual may have difficulty in breathing in severe cases, and the individual may become fatigued. There may also be mild 
back pain, and then the typical round back appearance, which we call the hunchback, there's pain, there's tenderness, and then there's stiffness in the spine. Kyphosis can also be classified as either postural, and with this one, there's no anatomical abnormality of the spine. It may also be structural, and this involves abnormality of the spine. So we move on to the second topic, and that is scoliosis. Scoliosis is a deformity of the spine and is seen as a lateral deviation or curvature. A scoliotic bend to the left or right and can resemble the letter S or C. So as seen in the picture, that is a typical example of scoliosis. The first picture is the patient in the scoliotic state and the second one is the patient after surgery had been performed. It affects males and females but scoliosis unlike kyphosis is more common in females than in males. So you can see the sideways curvature of the spine and that is scoliosis. For the types, we have congenital scoliosis caused by a bone abnormality which is often present at birth, or we may also have neuromuscular scoliosis as a result of abnormal muscles or nerves. Neuromuscular scoliosis may occur and is frequently seen in people with spinal bifida, cerebral palsy, or in those with various conditions that are accompanied by or result in paralysis. The third classification is degenerative scoliosis. It, it may result from traumatic, that is from an injury or illness, bone collapse, previous major back surgery, or osteoporosis thinning of the bones. And we also have idiopathic scoliosis, and this is the most commonest type. It has no specific identifiable cause. There's, however, strong evidence that it may be inherited. That is the idiopathic. And if we talk about idiopathic, we mean that there's no known cause or the cause is unknown. Now, the signs and symptoms. There's asymmetry of the shoulders on physical examination. Asymmetry of shoulders, scapulae, and waist creases and prominence of thoracic ribs on forward bend. The patient may have back pain or lumbar pain, the shortness of breath and gastrointestinal disturbances as well. So that is scoliosis. We now want to move on to our third topic and that is lordosis. Now, lordosis is an excessive inward curve of the lumbar spine, and it causes inward curve in the lower back as well, because there's going to be a shift of the normal curve or curvature of the spine. So it's normally referred to as a sway back. It also affects all age groups, and the causes may include postural deformity. Postural refers to position deformity. We may have dysitis, heavy abdomen during pregnancy. So mostly a lot of pregnant women have lordosis, but some get resolved after pregnancy. Then obesity may also lead to lordosis, osteoporosis, it's also another factor. Lordosis can be asymptomatic. There will be poor vertebral posture, protruded buttocks, and this is a major clinical feature. And sometimes 
some teenagers start adopting certain procedures because they are copying from their peers. Maybe they want a protrusion of their buttocks and therefore they adopt these postures and they end up having lordosis. Back pain that goes down to the leg is also another sign or a symptom and then the individual may experience severe neck pain. Now let's look at diagnostic investigations for kyphosis, lordosis, and scoliosis. It's diagnosed through physical examination and neurological examination for numbness, tingling sensation, pain, weakness, and Adam forward bend test is also done. Or a scoliometer is used. We may also do MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. X-ray of the spine may also be taken, full blood count, CT scan, pulmonary function test, patient's AHB, and ECG or electrocardiography may all be done. Now the management. This will depend on the cause of the disorder. Early management is especially important to the adolescent patient. Routine follow-up is essential and physiotherapy is done twice weekly to monitor the progress or correction of the curvature. And then choral stability exercise may also be done to manage and rehabilitate the patient. And the management of postural kyphosis involves physical therapy. This may be recommended to strengthen the patient's paravertebral muscle. And most importantly, the patient should be advised or told to make a conscious effort to work towards correcting, maintaining proper posture. Then with structural kyphosis, padded orthosis, that is a supportive appliance that may be applied to or around the body in the care or treatment of physical impairment or disability may be used. And it can be used to control pain, but these do not control the curve progression. Then bracing can also be done, and this is the standard treatment to control curve progression, especially in adolescents. So in the picture, we have bands, crotch bands, pelvic base, and all these corrective bands aim towards shaping or reshaping the patient's spine. Then surgical interventions are indicated when the deformity is progressive beyond severe angle, and that is 70 degree for Sherman's kyphosis or sagittal balance is significant significantly abnormal. Neurological symptoms such as pain, numbness, paresthesia, muscle spasms, and weakness may also exist. And then when the pain cannot be alleviated using conservative treatment. So these are indications for surgery and these surg are surgical procedures used to correct spinal deformity and to provide permanent stability to spinal column. So instrumentation and fusion will be done by way of surgical intervention. Now when we look at instrumentation, certain devices may be designed to hold the spine in position. Example is rods, bars, wires, and screws. Fusion, on the other hand, is the adhesive process of joining bony spinal elements in severe cases. And spinal fusion is performed both interiorly, that is from the front, that is anteriorly from the front, through thoracotomy, that is entering the chest, 
and then posteriorly from behind using instrumentation. Treatment for scoliosis, however, is based on the person's age, how much he or she is likely to grow more, the degree and pattern of the curve, and then the type of scoliosis the individual has. So for scoliosis, we may have three categories of treatments, observation, it's done, bracing, and then surgery may also done. And functional scoliosis, which is caused by an abnormality elsewhere in the body and is treated by treating that abnormality in the body, such as a difference in leg length. So there is no direct treatment of the spine because the spine is normal in these people. That is, in people with scoliosis, there may be no direct treatment. We only want to correct the abnormality that is causing the spine to deviate from the normal. Now, observation. I said earlier that in scoliosis, observation would have to be done. The physician observes the patient over a period of time to determine if the curve increases with growth. And then x-rays are also routinely done in addition to physical examination and then physiotherapy. So physical examination is very, very important. Please revisit your physical assessment of a patient from head to toe. Then the braces method this is a usual treatment of choice for adolescents who have a spinal curve between 25 degrees to 40 degrees, particularly if their bones are still maturing and if they have at least two years of growth remaining. And then those who have curves beyond 40 degrees to 50 degrees are often considered for surgery. And the goal for surgery is to make sure that the curve does not get worse, but surgery does not perfectly straighten the spine. And during the procedure, metallic implants are utilized to correct some of the curvature, and then it's held in the correct position until the bone graft, which is placed at the time of surgery, consolidates, and then creates a rigid fusion in the area of the curve. The surgery also involves joining the vertebrae together permanently, and this is called spinal fusion. And if the lordotive curve is not extensive or does not pose any discomfort, then it does not require any surgical treatment. Obesity reduction, that is losing weight through proper dieting and exercising, may be necessary in this instance. We are familiar with the general post and pre-op management, so we want to look at the specific pre-op management of patients with these conditions. The procedure is explained to the patient. Nurses are patients' advocates, so we are supposed to reinforce even after the procedure has been explained by the doctor. The nurse reinforces by explaining further to allay the patient's anxiety and physical assessments uh, on the skin and neurological examinations are all important. Patients should also be advised not to take non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or aspirin products for two weeks before the surgery. These medications can increase bleeding during surgery. And head traction can be done for 20 hours a day and a minimum of three months. The skin can also be treated with natural shampoo for lice, eczema, dandruff, and fungal infection. And patients is taught log rule technique. If you look at our principle of body mechanics, you know we have lifting, 
technique and how to turn patients in bed. And we have log rolling of a patient in bed. With this one, patient is taught as to how to do the log rolling rather than being log rolled on the bed by the nurse. And the area should be bathed with carbolic soap, check weight and height for BMI. Skin treatment is also given the night before surgery with chloridism. And then fleet enema may also be given. And essential medications are served before surgery and patient's nutrition is also important. Now the post-op care. Post-operatively, patient is positioned as instructed by the surgeon and ensure neurologic assessment as frequent as possible. In fact, when it comes to neuromuscular and then the nervous system conditions, there's a need for strict observation and assessment of the patient to prevent complications and then further damage to the patient. Ensure infusion is properly draining and ensure proper personal hygiene or catheter care. The patient's vital signs should be checked. Prescribed medication should be administered. And paracetamol, 250 milligrams of paracetamol may be given for children and one gram for adults. Antibiotics, anti-malaria, and anti-emetics may all be given. By way of rehabilitating a patient, patient is encouraged to continue with the log rolling. And depending on the degree of the curvature, some patients are given thoracolumbar orthosis after surgery for use or to use for three months. And then children usually are given the braces since they cannot be restricted. And patients are also educated on the importance of follow-up and physiotherapy exercises after or on discharge. Now let's look at some complications that our patients are likely to encounter. We may have lung reduction in lung capacity, round back deformity, neurological symptoms including leg weakness and paralysis. To conclude, kyphosis, lordosis, scoliosis are progressive spinal disorders that can affect both children and adults. And these disorders cause deformities to the back, not only the back, the side, or the patient's spine. And abnormalities can be corrected. The patient should be supported to undergo these corrective surgeries when the need arises. The students are to engage with the orthopedic nurses and surgeons in their hospital for further discussions. So once again, we have a reading list. You are being referred to this book for further reading. Thank you.